that's a, a, a bit of a mystery. Often things we don't understand well are scary and historically that's probably been really valuable. My students and I take bats into schools. Most of the students are perfectly comfortable looking at the bats as we hold them and others you can tell that no, there's something about this small, squirmy, shrieking animal that scares them. By the time we finish, my sense is that more of those students who were a little scared of them, oh no, they're kind of cute and funny looking and interesting. There was a bat that I called the old one. This was a banded bat, but I was never able to read the band because I didn't want to disturb the cluster. Then one time, the bat just happened to be on the edge of the cluster with the band on the outside, and that gave me an age of the bat and a species. It was a male little brown bat that was banded as an adult in 1975 the bat was at least 39 years old. The only bat that I found records of that is older than that bat is a 41-year-old bat that lived in Russia. And at this point in time, as far as I know, that's the second oldest bat that's been recorded and the oldest one in North America. Unfortunately, it. Uh, and when it died, it hadn't quite beaten the Russian bat, but I was hoping at the time it would. And my first real interaction with bats was bats were all swarming, getting ready to hibernate, thousands of them. You could hear the bats all flying around, and you could feel the wind as they flew past you, but none of them touched me, and I said, okay, this is very cool. And I was hooked. It's because they're misunderstood. There was so much mystery around bats, so I found them naturally interesting. People think of bats as flying mice. And this is not the case. They're not rodents. They're in their own family called Chiroptera, which means hand wing. They have the same bones in their fingers as we do, but they're elongated, and then they have the wing membrane across it. They're much smaller than they look when they're flying and their wings are outstretched. You hold a little brown bat, which weighs the same as a loony in your hand, and people say, oh, that must be a baby. No, that's a grown-up bat. They're just really small animals with a really cool life cycle. There are over 1,300 species of bats in the world, and there's a huge variety of sizes, what they eat. They're found on every continent except the Antarctic. They're actually very clean. If you think about how a cat grooms itself, bats are like that as well. If they get into a building, it's through an existing opening. It can be a very small opening, but they won't chew holes. So if those openings are blocked up, bats are not going to be able to get in. They can carry rabies like many other mammals, so you don't handle them if you find them on the ground because they would bite in self-defense. If you don't handle them, you're not going to be exposed. No bats are blind. All bats can see. Uh, the bats that we have in Alberta that are insect-eating bats use echolocation to find and locate small flying objects in the dark, like a mosquito, but they can see. They do a lot of things that you wouldn't expect. Here they get 
tons and tons of insects every night. Down in the southern U.S., the bats play a really integral role as a natural pesticide, saving farmers billions of dollars. But most importantly, they are just a component of our ecosystem. They're there for a reason. Every species is there for a reason, and all our bats are valuable. Technology has come a long way in allowing us to follow bats, to listen for bats and identify some of them without actually catching them or seeing them. But there are so many questions about bats, um, and not just in exotic places around the world, but here in Alberta. All sorts of questions we still don't understand the basic biology of the nine species we have in the province. Where are they in the winter? Where are they going for the winter when they're migrating? How do they survive in pretty extreme conditions? Lots of mysteries still to debunk and hopefully make them a little less scary. They fly when you can't see them. They make sounds that you can't hear. So what do you do? One thing that's, that's pretty standard is to catch bats. We can catch them, have them in hand, take measurements, look at general health. It doesn't hurt the bats at all. It's a great opportunity for researchers to handle them, to get confirmation of the species that are in an area. In Alberta, there are at least nine species of bats. And either federally or provincially, five of them are on a list. Two federally endangered species because of white nose syndrome and three sensitive species in the province because of wind energy. One of the greatest threats facing bats in North America is white nose syndrome. The fungal disease that's killed in some areas, 90, 95% of hibernating bats. We're looking at millions of bats now that have died in Eastern North America. It arouses the bats, it irritates them. They wake up from their hibernation. And the problem is they've only got so much fat stored up to survive their five, six, or even seven months of hibernating. And there's no food, right? There are no insects available for them. They get dehydrated and they literally starve to death. It first showed up in North America in 2007 in a cave in New York, and it is spreading. Um, it's been slowly spreading across Canada and the United States, in over half the states now. Just in the summer of 2018, it was confirmed that there are cases in Manitoba and Wyoming. When White Nose gets to Alberta, we'll see a dramatic decline in the most common species in the province, little brown bats. A major stumbling block in understanding what's going to happen is we don't know where all the bats hibernate. We have a a couple of caves that we know about and the other tens of thousands of individuals, we have absolutely no sense of where they are during the winter. The caves that we do know about 
Uh, we want to protect them during the winter to make sure people don't go in and disturb the bats. Because if bats get disturbed during their hibernation, they start to use up the fat that they've stored. Our biggest hibernacula site is closed to the public just to, to make sure no one accidentally brings in spores, having if they've come from somewhere in, in North America where it, there is an infection. There's a considerable amount of research to learn more about the fungus, to try to find ways that could perhaps uh, inoculate or vaccinate bats against it, or to get rid of the fungus altogether. But there are many challenges. Fungal spores can probably exist for years or decades inside a cave. And a cave itself is, a, is an ecosystem with other organisms living in it. So you have to be careful not to damage that ecosystem by applying, for example, a fungicide. There aren't really any solutions. I think what scientists are looking for is a way to reduce the impact of white noise syndrome. It's unlikely we're gonna get rid of those spores, but over time, bats may develop some sort of tolerance or resistance evidence from the eastern North America, from Europe, from Asia, where the same fungus is present, there is some natural immunity amongst the populations of hibernating bats that the fungus infects. And given enough time, populations will recover. So there's hope that the bats will develop resistance, but we just need to be careful because those populations could get very, very low because they have that low reproductive rate of only one pup per year. So what we're trying to do is see if we can give bats a helping hand and just keep those populations resilient enough for them to take the time to get to a point where they're going to be able to develop resistance. There's a huge push in Canada for a move towards renewables. And, and it's actually great, it's wind turbines have one of the lowest carbon footprints of any source of electricity. There is just happens to be this one really bad downside that they will probably drive at least one species to extinction. In North America, the flying animals that are killed the most by wind turbines are bats. Hundreds of thousands are killed annually. 80% of fatalities are of just three species of bat. So the impact to each individual species is much greater than we see with birds, for example. These tree roosting migratory species flying south appear to mate on the migratory pathways. Maybe big tall trees are the places that the males and females get together. And we've put up big tall dangerous structures in terms of wind turbines and the bats are attracted. Now, the reason that bats hadn't necessarily shown up in large numbers in North America was that the height and size of turbines had just undergone a big increase. And with that increase came almost an exponential increase in the number of bats killed. Forty bats, for example, are probably not going to be able to sustain their current populations with the number of, of individuals killed at wind turbines. We keep putting up more and more turbines and generating clean energy, reducing fossil fuels, which is good, but that also means that the fatality rate cumulatively in North America keeps going up. And when you consider that bats are really long-lived and reproduce really slowly, the impact of those high levels of fatalities over a short period of time 
they just don't have time to recover from that. The population has gotten smaller, so even if a, an individual turbine is killing fewer bats now than it was 10 years ago, the proportion of the population that's being killed is much greater now. If you want to have hoary bats around in 50 years, we need to be thinking broader scale. We have these animals that are, they're running a gauntlet. They start in Alberta, they go through Montana and run through the same wind farms, and they migrate through Colorado, Wyoming, and into New Mexico, and all of these places, and they're running into turbines the entire way. And we need to look cumulatively What's the effect on the population that's going from northern Alberta down somewhere in the U.S.? And if we can figure that out, then we can operate turbines normally during the day when there are no bats migrating, normally during rainy weather or really windy weather when the bats aren't flying, and curtail or reduce the operation of the turbines when there are migratory waves of bats going through. It's a fairly short season, six weeks, two months, only at night and only when it's warm, it's not raining and it's not too windy. That's when the bats are active. And companies have been very successful in reducing fatality rates at wind turbines by taking bat behavior into account and operating the turbines. Uh, sort of around the bat migration activity. I guess it's a good thing that the species that are killed by turbines are not the ones that are being killed by white nose syndrome, They're almost two completely separate groups of bats. On the other hand, that means that all of the bats in Alberta are facing one or the other uh, change to their environment and a threat to their populations. We've learned a lot. There's a lot more to still learn and understand. The world's changing quickly. And if we understand more about the basic biology of bats or anything else, the more we're going to be able to predict what's going to happen and maybe prevent bad things from happening or mitigating those bad things. Some things like wind turbines pop up and you say, whoa, we didn't see that coming. They're adorable. <laughs> they have four fingers and a thumb, just like us. I would like to be a bat biologist when I grow up. For people who are interested in bats, you can always help in some small way, whether it's protecting or creating better bat habitat and just spreading the word to people that bats are useful, they are important, and they don't need to be feared.